John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened, and He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we Do not know how it is that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish Pharisees. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, though, I was blind and now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've already told you and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he came from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We do know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out of the synagogue. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, 
Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not may see and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Now, 2,000 years after the healing that we read about a few moments ago, high on the 16th floor of an enormous 1970s era New York apartment building, late one January night, a father and his son were having a conversation in the bedroom, sitting, facing each other on their respective twin beds. It's an extremely serious conversation in a plain room at the very corner of the gigantic building where they wait anxiously for a summons to the hospital for transplant surgery. The room has two good windows looking down on the intersection of two major streets of an Upper East Side Manhattan neighborhood. Even so late into the night, the traffic flows and vehicle horns pepper and soundscape, pepper the soundscape as the sun at 20 terribly jaundiced from liver failure, gaunt as a heron, and desperately weak from the genetic disease that has afflicted him from birth, summons courage to ask his somber question. The frightening question is painful to frame or vocalize, but he's calculated that his father should know the answer. After all, His father has been a Presbyterian minister for 22 years. Daddy, do you believe that God gave me my illness because of my sins or yours or our grandparents? Some preachers I know make a frequent practice to use their children as illustrations in their sermons. I never have. I have strongly resisted doing it for a number of reasons that I think ought to be self-apparent, especially to the darn preachers. It's so unfair to the children, and it becomes so boring to the congregation. But I break my rule today because of the compelling confluence of this closely related New Testament reading assigned to today by the prescription of the lectionary. And so by life's coincidental circumstance, I've become a witness in the swirling maelstrom of drama surrounding the man born blind in John's gospel. That ancient man, too, was not a child, but he was of age, meaning that he was at least above 13 years old, an adult in Jewish tradition. But you know what? And I strongly do believe this. All of you are also witnesses by faith in the tumult around a healed sufferer and the Lord Jesus Christ long ago, and also today. 
We must be witnesses to the goodness of God in a world fraught with guilt and shame and blame. Because many people experience condemnation everywhere they look, inside and outside. A teaching moment now. Many, test, many passages in the Old Testament especially, but also in the New Testament, make use of judicial metaphors and descriptions to advance the transformative message of God's intimate involvement in the difficult lives of God's children. Again, I insist, we are all witnesses, and I will presume biased witnesses in the drama of God's goodness and love. Furthermore, and this is important and true, we weak, frail, sin-sick, and handicapped, and short-sighted, and grieving witnesses are totally unable, so very much of the time, to discern what Jesus said so plainly about why the man was healed who had been born blind. Remember what Jesus said the reason for his birth? blindness was? Do you remember the reason? Don't forget, even if you can't always understand, what did he say? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed. The question of miracle healings aside, and we absolutely have to set them aside for now, our assignment in our Christian lives of faith is both to trust and to make clear in our own lives the deep and often disturbing, sometimes very troubling and painful difference that Jesus has made in our lives. Does it look like when he gave sight to the man born blind that it solved all the man's problems? Does it look like that to you? doesn't to me. No. It created new and awful problems, both for him and for his parents. The result was his being cast out of the synagogue, for goodness sake. And there was no nearby Baptist or Catholic or Presbyterian church that he could quickly connect with the next week. But the light of Christ was also revealed to him because John reports that Jesus after all the conflict had settled down, sought the man out and found him and revealed himself, Jesus, to be the Messiah. And the man worshiped Jesus. And now, we are far from the first people who experienced the lack of miracle healings in the lives of those we love. And if the worship of Jesus and faith in God depend only on miracle healings, then our experience of God is limited. It's limited to strict Pavlovian conditioning psychology, a transactional faith where everything is on an exchange basis and God's actions are controlled by ours. We all know people who give or provide nothing at all without something in return. Believe it or not, there are even some pub public politicians who work this way. Believe it or not. I'll serve you if you make it worth my while to do so. That's manifestly not how Jesus relates to us. Did you know that during the 1500s, John Calvin noticed that miracles like those in the Bible had disappeared from the world. And to reconcile their disappearance, Calvin simply concluded that the age of miracles had ceased, had closed, was his word. The age of miracles had closed by the 1500s. There were no longer the inexplicable events such as healings and so forth that Calvin saw described in the Bible and that we've all seen too. This was one of several points of dispute 
at the time with the Roman Catholic Church and would remain so for a long time because of that part that miracles play in faith for so many people. I admit that I cringe whenever I drive by that highway billboard that declares, there is evidence for God. I'm just sad that anyone could need more evidence than the stunning Bible testimony. In our modern age of wonder drugs and billion dollar bailouts, we entitled humans look for and expect a quick fix to everything. The payday loan that we can default on without consequence or shift somehow to our benefit. So it's extremely important for us to wander back into the dramatic events that we read in John's Gospel. It was the miracle that made the people uncomfortable, even then. Before that, in the life of the man born blind and his parents, life was static. The system was at stasis. Everyone was familiar with their part. Maybe they were not content, but they knew nothing could change until it did. In those days, as in ours, people clamor for a logical explanation for suffering. There must be a reason for this suffering. What caused or causes it? Who's responsible? Whose fault was it? We want to know usually so we can prevent it in the future or reverse it in the present. And often we blame others. Our son's genetic disease was diagnosed And his mother and I looked anxiously at each other to figure out who was wrong, who was at fault, who had the gene that caused the disease. But Jesus put a new twist on an old question. It's not about sin or who sinned. It's about God's glory. Now, I failed to go that large when my son looked to me for an answer, but my care for him were equally what he wanted, more than a theological answer to his question. He needed to sense that I was with him that night in his pain. Not to mention that he knew that he was in mine. Because a diary of his I found years later revealed that to be true. The new view that Jesus gave to that burning question, whose fault is it, about whether we deserve God's punishment, contradicted centuries of belief in Jesus' time, and it still does. We still wonder. And during Lent, when we are looking inward and preparing spiritually to move through the crucifixion and resurrection. The questions about our sin and responsibility for it are surely very timely. Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. The reason he was born blind was so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world, he said. One of the great I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. The light of Jesus flooded into the life of one that he healed. What more light could there be than someone who opens their eyes for the first time and sees the world? And yet it came with turmoil in the village, the jurors and the judgmental authorities. As usual, Jesus did not take the low road, the standard outlook. Have we learned his lesson? Do we now always believe that pain or evil might be so that God's works might be revealed? Let's try. I'm on the same side as folks who say God must be vain or petty to cause people to have birth defects just so that God can be revealed or possibly glorified. Fortunately, centuries of scientific advance has meant we just don't see God as that cosmic puppeteer in such a silly way any longer. 
In any case, Jesus isn't about to bicker very long on such subjects. With that earthy, ancient method, Jesus spat, made mud with saliva, and smeared it on the man's eyes, saying at the time, now go wash in the pool. The man went and washed and came back able to see. The treatment was common at the time for various ailments. It was not unique to Jesus. Do you wonder why the story doesn't end there? I have. I mean, what better ending, right? That's great. A miracle. It should end there, and yet it's not even half finished. The man's neighbors all knew him before his healing. Isn't this the man who used to beg? Some of them said it was, but others said it wasn't. But someone said it was, it's someone like him. You see, Facebook is nothing new at all. (laughs) I think there is a touch of ancient humor in the note about how the man himself has to keep saying, yes, I'm the man, yes. Lots of people believe their own imagination. So the jury and witnesses are skeptical and they insist on knowing just how this blindness was cured. But all the man can give them are the facts, recounting simply what had happened with the spit and the mud, the smearing and the washing. And still the bystanders are like terrier dogs in quite contrast with the healed man. They just won't let it go. They won't let go of a wonderful thing. Isn't that ironic? Anyway, the mob took the poor, healed, blind man to the Pharisees, the authorities over all religious matters. John repeatedly calls them the Jews throughout the gospel, but he means the Jewish authorities, the Pharisees. For indeed, all the characters in this and all the stories would have been Jews. The authorities, the Pharisees, would have had some answer about who had sinned. You can be sure. With their power, they are accustomed to judging. Well, wouldn't you know it was a Sabbath day, a day of rest when the healing had occurred, so trouble looms very big. The poor guy has to repeat his story about how it had happened, and he doesn't polish it or spin it. He just tells it, and still skepticism prevailed. The poor parents are called in for their witness, their consultation. Miracles must be bona fide, you know. We don't want to be fooled by fakes. Anyway, all the parents could say under intense interrogation was, look, we know he is our son, and we know he was born blind. But we don't know how he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him! He is of age. He'll tell you. And I, Howard, love how human that was, how mildly it insults the powerful, and let us say shows how blind the leaders were. The parents told them to ask the son because they were afraid of the authorities and didn't want to offend them. The leaders had already made it clear that anyone who confessed Jesus as the Messiah was going to be put out of the synagogue. So this is a major turn in the story. Once again, the son's called on, and now it becomes obvious that the Pharisees were trying to convict Jesus, not just trying to find out about the healing. They said, give glory to God. We know Jesus is a sinner. But the cured man answered, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but I do know that I was blind before, and now I see. And for my money, That is the greatest existential line in the New Testament. Complete exasperation ensues. Legal recriminations. The judges get nasty against a beggar who is blind but has found his sight because they are feeling pressure against their power. And so ironically, they accuse and revile him in astonishment. And for our immense benefit today, The man born blind replies boldly, this is amazing, more amazing than my miracle perhaps. You do not know where he came from. 
And yet he opened my eyes. Their only answer was bitterness. You were born entirely in sin, and you're trying to teach us? And they drove him out of the synagogue. The conclusion comes when Jesus seeks out the man at last, saying, Do you believe the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, sir? Please tell me, so I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him. And the one you are talking to now is he. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. So let us not abandon our faith in the God who opens blind eyes to see the reality of the light of Christ in our own lives and in the lives of all those around us. Now to God who is able to do far, far more than anything we'd ever ask or think according to the power that works within us. To God be the glory through Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.